Shalom, guys, and thank you for joining me for another week of our Hebrew study together. Last week, we covered the pronunciation of Hebrew, Hebrew letters specifically, and we also covered uh, the correspondence between Hebrew letters and the English letters. And so this week, we are going to learn some more cool aspects about the Hebrew language that are helpful to understanding how the Hebrew language works and sort of the origin of the Hebrew language. And then in the second half, we're going to try to split it up into two parts. And in the second half, we're going to try to practice together. And the idea for the practicing, people do not have to do this if they don't want to. They can do it just on their own screens. But it would be preferable if some, at least one or two people, would be willing to volunteer to share their screen as they are doing the exercise. Uh, I would go first just to kind of illustrate how it goes. And then other people who are interested can volunteer to do it themselves and share their screen. And then other people will also do it at the same time on their own screen. And the idea is that we will be uh, learning this like in a fluency way. And so the best way to do that is doing it over and over again, you know, repetition um, and not going too fast. Because I think a lot of times people try to learn languages and they just try to learn everything about the language, but they don't take the time to, re to really let it sink in. I've, I've done that myself where, you know, I spend years trying to study a language. But the problem is I don't do it consistently enough, so I don't become fluent. But if we're here together once a week, every week, we're doing it on a weekly basis. That's going to be part of our uh, regular memory. And we're going to be practicing it on a regular basis. Even if it's just once a week, that's regular enough to be a consistent thing. If we're doing that. Then I think we will learn, especially if we're going, progressing in a slower way. Not too slow, but, you know, making sure each step we understand before we go to the next step. And, uh, you know, I, I've in, in school before, when I've tried to learn different subjects, I've noticed that, you know, you, let's say you get a C or a D in one of your classes, you progress the, to the next grade. That's not a good idea, in my opinion. I think instead, they should really focus on you mastering the material first before you progress to the next grade, so to speak, or the next semester. So um that's what we're going to be doing we're going to be trying to focus on that uh, mastering of the basics that we've been talking about and that i've been sharing so with that said i want to share with you guys something very interesting about roots Hebrew roots. So basically, as many people are aware, uh, for the Hebrew language, they, they are the roots are tri, I forget the term, but basically it's three letters uh, for every root. Now, the, what's interesting is there are some exceptions to this where the roots have two letters in them instead of three. But there's actually a really good explanation for why that is the case. But so I am of the position that all roots originally are three letters, always, okay? So any two letter words you see is actually a shortened version of a longer root. Also, you are going to see sometimes four letter words. According to this view of the three letter roots, that means the four letter root 
I mean, so the four letter word is derived from an even smaller root. So the idea is whenever you see a word in the Hebrew that you don't know, can you try to, to, to determine its meaning? And the way you can do that is by determining what the root is and then learning about that root's meaning. And so I've learned a few years ago, it was actually been, you know, it's been a good amount of time, probably since 2017, 2016-ish. So it's been a long time since I've known this particular interesting thing. Basically, so there's 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, but half of them are called servile letters. And the other half are called radical letters. Now the radical letters are called radical because now that word is related to, in the, in the way that it's used in linguistics, it, it's related to the meaning of root word, radical, okay? So a radical word is a letter, excuse me, a radical letter is a root letter. That means if you see this letter anywhere in this word, it is 100% part of the root, without a shadow of a doubt. It is part of the root. The other letters, the other 11 letters, they're called servile letters. And if you see the letter, they're not necessarily part of the root. It depends on which other letters are in the word. But so that's actually gonna help you find roots when you understand that half of the alphabet is always part of the root. So uh, let me open a document here and I'm gonna show you guys, actually, I think I do have it in one of my document files. If that's the case, then I don't need, then I don't need to write it up uh, because if I have to write it up, it'll take a little bit, of, it won't take that much time, but you know, it's always ideal to save time when possible. So hopefully I have that. Let me just, I have three documents uh, open right now of, of Hebrew stuff I've done. So let me just check those to see if I have the list. I know off the top of my head, but I want to actually demonstrate it to you guys. So to show you guys. All right, so here we are. So I'm going to share the screen in just a moment. I'm zooming in to give you guys a better view. All right, let me start sharing the screen now. Um, wait a minute. I'm supposed to be able to, to share a specific app. That's what I want to do. I don't want to share my whole screen. I just want to share the, the, the apps, uh, the, the specific. Uh... What? It, it, let me let me did it last. It let me do it last time. I don't I don't get it. Um. All right, guys. So now I'm going to share the screen. Sorry for the delay. All right, so right here we have the letters in arranged alphabetically in in the Paleo Hebrew as well as underneath the regular Hebrew that we're familiar with. So the radical letters or the, the letters which will always be part of the root are Gimel, Dalit, 
Zion, Het, Tet, Shin, excuse me, Samek, uh, Pe, Ayin, Sadi, Koh, and Resh. Any word with those letters, it's always part of the group. Um, so in other words, the letters are G, D, Z, H, T, H, S, P, O, J, Q, R. So those are the letters. And the servile letters are the letters that can be added to a root while in an to change the meaning, but also it could also be part of the root itself. So it depends. It's a little more complicated to determine. So it's sometimes part of the root, sometimes it's not. And you have to learn based on when you see it. So you have Aleph, Bet, He, Wa, Yod, Kaf, Lamid, Mem, Nun, Shin, Tav. And, and in other words, A, B, E, U, I, K, L, M, N, S, T. Those are the letters that, or this is S, H, actually. It corresponds to the English S, but it's pronounced S, H. And this letter corresponds to the X or S, H letter of Greek, but it's pronounced with an S sound. So it's reversed, like I mentioned last time uh, in last week's meeting. But yeah, so, so those are the radicals and servos. Now, let me see here. I also have, let me broaden this for you guys. This is a document file that I typed up several years ago for my own studies uh, by basically writing down information I learned over time kind of like a notebook, if you will, for my personal studies. So radical letters are letters, except in dialects and rare alternate spellings. So for example, Aramaic uses the letter Dalit as a servile letter. Hebrew does not, but Aramaic does. Sometimes Hebrew takes Aramaic words and borrows them in later Hebrew. Not so much in biblical Hebrew, but in later Hebrew, they will borrow Aramaic words and therefore they will borrow Aramaic uh, peculiarities like servile letters that are in Aramaic. And, and then there might just be different dialectal differences where sometimes they might have, uh, they might use. Uh, serve our letters in the way that Aramaic does. So, um, so what we have here are universal serviles, external serviles, and introductory serviles. Universal serviles are letters which can be added anywhere in the word. It can be added in the beginning, which is called a prefix. It can be added at the end of a word. It's called a suffix. It can be added in the middle all right, let me rephrase. It can be added at the beginning of a root, which is a prefix, the end of a root, which is a suffix, and in the middle of a root, which is an infix. Okay, so aleph, wa, and yod can be added anywhere in a word, uh, a root. But wa and yod, much more so. Aleph, appears to be more of a, of, it evolved over time 
as a universal servile, but originally it wasn't necessarily, it, it wasn't uh, in the beginning, uh, excuse me, it wasn't in the middle of a, a root in the beginning, but uh, as the language evolved, it started being used by the Dead Sea Scroll speakers, it started to be used as an infix where they could add it inside a root primarily for a uh, vowel, uh, vowel uh, sound, to, to mark a vowel sound. Just like the, the Jews use the vowel markings, well, the, the many Jews, instead of using vowel markings, they used vowel letters as vowel markings, where they would, uh, uh, unwritten vowels would be written with other letters. So that's uh, something you'll see when you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, when you look at the Hebrew, you'll notice that they often add extra letters as vowel to, to signify the unwritten vowels. So external serviles, they cannot be added in the middle of a root, but they can be added at the beginning or at the end, prefix or suffix. Those letters are hey, kaf, mem, noon, and tav. So like I said, they'll never be added in the middle of a root. So if you see that, you know, you, you can use that to determine, okay, that means the root must be these letters before, or, uh, or uh, contrasting, or it would be these letters after. So it helps you narrow down uh, what letters are part of the root by knowing that these letters can only be added to a root at the beginning or end of it and not in the middle of a root. The introductory servals, in contrast, can only be added at the beginning of a root, a prefix. So uh, that would be bet, lamid, and shin. Now, some interesting things. This is the way it is currently in Hebrew, but there is evidence in older, uh, it says right here, participants can now see your screen. Does that mean you guys haven't been seeing my screen the whole time? I'm not sure why it says that. So uh, maybe it periodically shows me that, I don't know. But anyways, uh, hopefully you guys were seeing the screen the whole time. Uh, so Hebrew changed as a language over time. And the original Hebrew spoken by, you know, if Adam spoke Hebrew, but certainly, you know, if Noah spoke Hebrew, but certainly if um, Abraham and Moses, according to, according to Jubilees, Abraham was taught the language of Hebrew after it was lost. And Moses most certainly knew Hebrew, right? So, but what Hebrew did they know? Did they know the biblical Hebrew? No, they didn't. Biblical Hebrew didn't exist at that time. Hebrew at that time was far more ancient, far more complex than the current Hebrew and the biblical Hebrew that we're familiar with. Paleo-Hebrew, not even close to the original Hebrew. So I believe there is very good evidence that the original Hebrew is uh, much more, much closer to Akkadian, the ancient language of Akkadian. And so uh, in Akkadian, the letter shin is used as a suffix uh, for nouns, uh, particularly when it comes to animals. It's used with animals to signify a small animal, typically. So there does seem to be some evidence that it was, at one time in the Hebrew language in the long past, shin was sometimes added at the end of words, but for the, at the end of roots. But for the most part, if you see shin, it's either, part, it's definitely part of the root or it was added as a prefix. Lamid, on the other hand, occasionally Lamid seems to be added 
in no let's see i think that's resh actually yeah that's resh resh occasionally is added into words randomly uh and that also might be an aramaic feature aramaism they call it so to kind of convey, you know, this whole thing of like, you know, prefixes, suffixes, you know, what's the, what is it talking about? In English, we, we use prefixes all the time. So you can prefix, for example, the prefix DE, you see in, in the screen, you can see as I'm sharing the screen, I wrote it down here for you guys, but so you can prefix the word crease or the root crease, you can prefix the uh, letters DE to form decrease, or you can prefix the letters IN to form increase. And there are many other words in English that you can add a DE or IN at the beginning of the word to transform the meaning of the root word. Similarly, you can do the same thing, but instead of, instead of two letters, it's usually one letter that you just add at the beginning. And, the, and those letters are are these letters that I showed you guys here. So all servile letters, as you can see, all servile letters can be prefixed to a, a root word. Um, most of them can be suffixed. Not all, but most can. Most of these serviles can be suffixed as well, but only a very few can be added in the middle of a root word. Um, let's see here. Okay, and so I give a, I give I give uh, for a the example for a suffix. For example, the suffix meant in English m e n t can be added to the words punish and judge to form punishment and judgment. So a similar thing happens in Hebrew where you add letter of uh, one letter or even more than one letter. Sometimes you have two letter combinations, just like in English, where you prefix two letters or you suffix two letters, and those always have a specific meaning. Now, in this video, we're not going to go into all those different meanings because there's a lot of different meanings uh, of, di of, different, of different suffixes and prefixes, and I don't even have them all memorized. So we will de de delve into that at a later date. An example of infixes would be, in English, the infix O can be infixed when wishing to convey a different tense, such as drove from drive, dove from dive. If you see a word which has any of these letters, it is almost always the case that those letters are not part of the root, but are affixes only. Yod, wa, aleph. Oh yeah, so in any root, if you see yod, wa, or aleph, there's a high probability that that's not part of the root word, but that it's added to the root word. <clears throat> and then I make this rule. This is my rule according to my studies, but it could, it might not necessarily be correct, but this is what I have concluded that it, it holds pretty well, I, I, I believe. So, um, Okay, first of all, if there are only two letters in a word, those two letters are both part of the root word and not affixes. I say there are rare exceptions. Um, did we lose someone? Hold on, who did we lose? Oh, Gregory dropped out. All right, well, we'll see if he comes back. Um, So if, if only one letter in a three letter word can be an affix, that letter must necessarily be an affix. Uh, affix mean, affix is a word that means infix, prefix, or suffix. It includes all of them. It's kind of like you got rectangles, squares, circles, triangles, those are shapes. A shape is any of those. Same way an affix is any possible changes that are added to a word, any letters that are added, prefix, infix, or suffix. So um, if only one letter in a three letter word can be an affix, 
that letter must necessarily be an ethics. So it is my belief that if there is a, a affix in the word, uh, then it almost always is added uh, to the root, okay? And, uh, and then, I, then I have here, if two or three letters in a three letter word can be an affix, one of those two or three letters must necessarily be an affix. And with rare exceptions, only one of those letters can be an affix. Because you always need two letters to be part of a root. You can't have a one letter root. Therefore, uh, if there's three letters, but two of them are affixes, that means one of those affixes has to be part of the root. Because like I said, you need at least two, you need at least two uh, letters to be a root. If three or four letters in a four letter word can be an affix, unless the word is a compound, two of those four letters must necessarily be an affix because like I said, you need to have two letters for a root. Uh, and then only two of those letters can be an affix. Um, so I say, if you see in a word, the letter, the letter wa, I got a bug in my glasses. If you see in a word, the letter wa, it is except in extremely rare cases, always an affix and not part of the root word. And uh, if you see the letter yod, in the middle of a three letter word or four letter word, it with rare exceptions must necessarily be an affix. And again, for Gregory, because he, uh, I don't think you heard this part, a an affix, if you're not familiar, an affix is a, can be a prefix, a suffix or an infix. It's any of those. All right, then I also have concluded that each letter has a special meaning. Now I tried to figure out these meanings through study. These meanings are not exact because I deduce them through study of the Hebrew language. So if you guys in your own studies come upon a superior definition for these letters, then I would encourage you to go with that superior definition that you've discovered. But through my searching, I have determined that each letter itself has a specific meaning. And it is from these specific meanings that words are formed with their meanings. Uh, and so there are no roots that have four letters or more. It's always three letter roots. So if you see a four letter word, there are some in the Hebrew language, then that is always a compound or a foreign word. A compound is taking two different words, putting them together. Uh, and let me rephrase, it's not always a compound. The other exception can be, it has a prefix, right? Or a suffix or an infix. But if there's no affixes added and, it, and it's, remember I said that uh, if you see 11 letters, they're always part of the root without exception. Well, so let's say, four of those letters are part of a word. That means that it's either a compound, two different words combined together to form a new word, just like in English, we do that all the time. Lighthouse, right? Taken from the word light and taken from the word house. Bind it together, you got lighthouse. Same thing that happens in Hebrew, but that's much less common. Compounds are actually rare in Hebrew, but they sometimes have. Then the other example, like I said, is it can be a foreign word borrowed from another language, a loan word. English does this all the time. Hebrew, at least biblical Hebrew and Paleo Hebrew, uh, like the Dead Sea Scrolls Hebrew, does not typically borrow from other languages, but there are borrowings. There's actually borrowings from Sumerian, Akkadian, and Aramaic, and there's also borrowings from Persian. So biblical Hebrew does actually borrow from various languages, just not as, not as much as English. 
Okay, so um, let's see here. All right, so with that said, the 22 letters I have determined are roughly approximately as follows in meaning. Okay, so Aleph means pose, posing something. Like pose basically means to go, go towards something, like to put in, to pause it. B or bet means to contain. So if you see this letter, it has the meaning of contain. So like if you're trying to figure out a root word and you don't have a dictionary, you can actually add these meanings together and come up with a plausible definition of the root meaning by combining these meanings. It's not full, you know, it's not fail proof. Uh, you might come up with completely wrong meanings, but this is a, to help as a guide. And I do believe that the, the meanings of these words actually ultimately originate from these letter definitions. And like I said, maybe not these specific ones, maybe there are some more accurate letter definitions, but these are the ones that I've concluded so far for my studies. So extend. So gimel, I perceive to mean extend. Dalit means to foster. Hey means to subsist. Wa means to connect. Zion is depending on something or hinging on something. Het means to bind or compact. Tet means to entangle. Yod means forward, so it's forward moving or towards something. Similar to pose, but it forward is in more a very specific uh, direction. Kaf I have as image, lamid, turn or direct. Mem is source, noon, propagate, samic, invigorate, pay, confine, ayin, focus, sadi, break, kof is deprive, resh, discharge, shin, relate, and tav, present. Present as in uh, it, it can have multiple meanings, but uh, like present as in, uh, in in the current place it is, present. Uh, but it can also mean to send something, you know, present something. Um, and in my view, this is different than what you've been here, what you hear from people. A lot of people say Hebrew is not abstract like Greek, but it's actually concrete. I actually say it's the opposite. I think Hebrew is heavily abstract in its original. Um, so that's what I would, would say about that. Um, so let me stop sharing the screen for, for now. I have a whole document there. Uh, but I was only wanting to share that part about the the root. So hopefully you guys find that pretty interesting. Uh, and like I said, the the letter meanings are not, not like some of them have more basis than others. Some like for particularly the the uh, servile letters, you know, the prefixes, suffixes, or infixes. Those meanings to those letters are far more confident because they're added to words to change meaning. So image, why do I pick image? Because ka is added as a prefix to mean like or as something. So it would make sense that it's conveying, when it's added to a word, it's giving the idea of an image or a reflection. Lamid, similarly, when you add it to a word, it means to it means to or for, so it's turning towards something or it's directing towards something, to or for. 
Uh, mem means source. When you see mem, typically mem means to be, it, mem is used to mean from, or can be used to mean of. It can also be used, you know, mem is, is also used as a plural. Um, but so it's used in different ways like that. And so mem, I define as source for that reason. And propagate, similarly, noon is added uh, at the end of a word, sometimes at the beginning as well, but often, more often at the end. And propagate, or, or noon specifically, um, like, so, so for example, El Elyon means God Most High. Uh, it means God most high, and Elion has a prefix, uh, a suffix, excuse me, it has a suffix. The suffix is O-N, or wa noon, the letters wa and noon. And so noon, part of that wa noon, the noon has the meaning of propagate or like a plethora. And so wa noon means est or most. So highest, Elion is the L part means high and the Yon means est or most, high most or highest. And, but the noon part of that means like the propagate. Uh, and Shin means to relate. And shin is the relative prefix. When you want to make a relative uh, comparison of sorts, uh, you use shin. And so uh, I'll go into that in another video sometime. But, but yeah, so that's why I pick relate. And then pres present or present is for tav and um, I forget some of the uh, reasoning behind me doing that. I'll have to look into that again. But yeah, so that's kind of the, the basic gist of how I came upon some of these meanings. Oh yeah, the, the word for wa, like the letter wa comes from the word wa. Like each letter has a name and the name is a word in the Hebrew language. But wa is unique in that the, the letter wa also comes from the word wa. In, all right, let me rephrase. Um, yeah, yeah. So the word wa and the and the letter wa it's the same. So uh, what does the word wa mean? It means to connect. So that's why I define it as having the meaning of connect. And the other ones are more complicated to determine. Oh yeah, contain uh, for, for bet, that's added at the beginning. And, and bet is used to mean in, you're, it's in something or with something. So that's why contain, it's inside something or it's with something. So with that said, I shall try to move on here. Um, now the reason, let me just quickly say this. The reason I believe Akkadian is much closer to the Hebrew, original Hebrew than biblical Hebrew and Dead Sea Scroll Hebrew is because um, there are actually ancient dialects of Akkadian which are closer to Hebrew. Um, and so for example, Akkadian is a very similar Semitic language. They're called Semitic languages. They're related to each other. So Arabic, Aramaic, Hebrew, they're all similar. Ethiopian, very similar because they have the same, uh, generally the same grammar ideas, rules typically. Uh, vocabulary is very often the same. The same three letter roots are occurring in all these different 
languages in the Semitic language family. But Akkadian specifically has a much longer history of attestation. So if Paleo-Hebrew or Biblical Hebrew in the alphabet existed in ancient times way long ago, we would have records of it. We would have fragments of it. We have zero fragments of Hebrew letters prior to the year 1000 BC. But what we do have before that time, we have a plethora of cuneiform tablets. That's all we have. We only have those. And then, you know, we have the Egyptian uh, hieroglyphic tablets or whatever they write the hieroglyphics on, uh, whatever they wrote hieroglyphics on. So the fact that cuneiform is the only written form of any language that we have prior to 1000 BC indicates that cuneiform was the only thing that existed in hieroglyphics. Those are the only types of language that existed at that time. And what's interesting is we have multiple Akkadian-like dialects or languages which are considered Canaanite or similar, closer to Canaanite or Hebrew. Canaanite is another word for Hebrew that scholars use. Um, but so these other uh, dialects of Akkadian are significantly closer to the Hebrew language than Akkadian is. But it's also like, it's like a middle version between Akkadian and Hebrew. So these would be, there's something called Canaano Akkadian, Canaano Akkadian. And that means it's Akkadian that the Canaanites used, but their Akkadian is like extremely close to biblical Hebrew. Like basically it uses Akkadian vocabulary and Akkadian spelling, but it uses Hebrew grammar rules in difference to um, Akkadian. And it also uses Hebrew meaning compared to Akkadian meaning, because sometimes there's a difference. One of the most fascinating differences between Akkadian and Hebrew that I find most interesting is the word for king and the word for prince. In Hebrew, the word for king is melech, and it actually means ruler. The word for prince, on the other hand, is sar. But in Akkadian, it's the exact opposite. In Akkadian, a, a prince is a melech, and a king is a sar. And what's interesting about this is I actually am inclined to think that Akkadian preserves the original meaning of those words, and that it's Hebrew that's changed the meaning over time. But what's interesting is that the Akkadian that the Canaanites used, they when they wrote those words in Akkadian, they used uh, Malek to mean king, just like in Hebrew. And they used Sar to mean prince, just like in Hebrew. So we see early uh, origin of Hebrew in the Canaanite Akkadian dialect that existed in ancient times. But so to, to support the view that I just shared that the Akkadian definition to those words are more original, like I said, the word melech actually comes from a root that means to rule. It's a more general term, a ruler. So a prince is a inferior ruler, right? So a ruler in general. So that makes sense to be a prince. But a, a, a sar, on the other hand, if that means prince, the word prince means chief. It means supreme. We use, the, for some reason in English, we use prince to mean lower, when really prince should be chief, the highest, because prince comes from a root meaning to mean principal, the, the utmost, the first. In Latin, the word means first, you know, the top. So why do we use it to mean the lower? That's the weird thing, right? But so I, that's why I think the original meaning of the word Hebrew word prince meant kings, it meant the, 
the chief, the highest ruler you could have. But then later on, Hebrew flipped the meaning for some reason. But it's because of the Canaanites. The Canaanites were the ones who flipped it first. And you have something called Eblaite. Have you ever heard of the Ebla tablets? The Ebla tablets were written in Ebla, Eblaite. And Eblaite is basically very close dialect to Akkadian, but it preserves uh, Hebrew stuff, some Hebrew things that Akkadian does. But it's Akkadian, but it has Hebrew, some Hebrew grammar that Akkadian doesn't have. So it's so. Um, with that said, I, I think there is some good reason to believe that Hebrew in its original form was basically another, a different dialect of Akkadian. But in, a, in my view, <clears throat> there was a original Hebrew Akkadian, which was the more pure form. And then the Akkadian that the Babylonians preserved is a inferior form to the original. But Hebrew is also inferior to the original, even more so. So that's enough for that. And we're getting close to the one hour mark. So let me see what else I can share with you guys. Hopefully what I've been sharing so far isn't too much information overload, but like I said, we'll be going through some of this stuff again in the future, but I'm giving you guys an overview of these interesting concepts. <clears throat> so, let's see here. One of the things that I think we sh I should mention that's important is we have um, let's see. Okay, so I'm going to show you guys the the different uh, plurals, singulars, and gender for. Hebrew, okay. Let me just pull that up. Now, it's going to seem pretty straightforward, you know, for people who have some familiarity with Hebrew, they're, they're going to say, well, I already know that, but I have some interesting information about it that you guys might find interesting. Sorry, that was devil speak. Interesting information that you might find interesting. But uh, anyway, um, So let me just pull it up. Because like I said, I have, a, I have a few files. So I'm just seeing which file I have it in. Maybe I'll just have to write it out in a new file. Just check one more time. All right, for some reason I don't have, I don't seem to have it in these files. I don't know why I wouldn't have it because that's pretty basic to have the, to have the, oh, wait a minute. There, no. Like I don't get it, I, sh I should have it in one of my files. I mean, I have this, but it's it's uh, incorrect in this in this particular file. So, what I'm going to have to do is, like I said, I'll just 
make a new file because I don't want to give you guys inaccurate information. And so I have a I have a document file with with gender on it, but I had some speculation on it at the time, and I some of the speculation is inaccurate. So I don't want to share that false speculation with you guys. So that's why I'm going to put it in a new document file. So let me start sharing the screen with you guys. All right, so here is the document. Let's make this bigger uh, letters. It's got to be in the Hebrew font. Let me see. All right, there we go. All right. So we are going to use the word melech. Now, Hebrew does have um, end forms of letters, but I'm gonna explain that maybe in a different video. So for now, just to make it simpler, I'm just gonna use the normal form of a letter. So malek, okay? That is the base form of the word. When you have this, that means a, uh, that, that is a, you know what, let's see, hold on, I need to make this better for you guys. All right, I need to make a, uh, I'm going to insert a table. All right, let's try this again. All right, so we've got here the different, the different forms. Um, Just be patient with me here. Sorry for it taking a little bit of time, but I just want to help explain what's going on here. So, and then got to make this. English. All right, so singular, dual, plural. All right, so here's that's what we got. So we have, uh, I'm just going to use the end form actually. Okay, so so that is the end form for the letter ka. When there's no other letters after, we use the letter that that form of ka in biblical Hebrew. In original Hebrew, Paleo Hebrew, uh, there there wasn't a final form, but uh, the final form was developed in biblical Hebrew at a later stage, after the Babylonian exile around actually the time of the Babylonian exile. It seems to be have developed in Babylon. So then we have the dual, um, we have the plural. All right, so, whoops.
Now, so here's what we've got. In current, in current Hebrew, we have in, we have, uh, if it's a singular masculine, so this word means ruler or king. It's a masculine ruler, therefore a king. It's one king. But if it's more than one king, it's a plural. Now, Hebrew makes all masculine, masculine plural into a, a plural. Whereas originally in Hebrew, there was two forms. There was a dual and there was a plural. The dual is preserved in the feminine. And I'm going to explain what dual means in a second. But so feminine has a hey added at the end, and that makes it a, a feminine word. So the, the core word is melek, and then you add a hey at the end in the singular, that makes it a feminine version of the word. So melaka or Melka means a female or feminine ruler, also known as a queen. And then you have plural, which is more than one feminine ruler. That would be queens. And so you have at the end here, wa ta. Whenever you have a word that's feminine and it's a plural, it almost always has a wa ta at the end. But for dual, you have tav, yod, mem. So let me explain what dual is. Originally in languages, you had, so singular, you know what singular is, that's just one. Plural, we think we know what that means, but originally plural didn't mean quite what we think it means. See, we think plural means more than one, but in ancient times, Plural did not mean more than one. Plural meant more than two. Dual meant two. So if you refer to anything as a two, you refer to it as a couple, a, a couplet. It's a couple because it's joined together as a single entity, a couple. And yet it's more than one, so it's plural, but it's singular because it's a couple. It's a grouping, it's a single couple. So that's why it's called dual, because it's both singular and plural. Remember last week I touched upon the different parts of language where it's both, where it's inward, outward, and both. And so dual is both. So it's both singular and plural, because the couple is a single unit, but it's a plural because it's made up of more than one individual in that couple. But so whenever you see two in he, two of something in Hebrew, originally it would have been in the dual, but Hebrew changed it over time so that it doesn't, it often doesn't use dual, it just uses plural. Same thing actually happens in English. English originally had a dual as well in old English, but over time we've thrown out the dual usage. In most languages that tends to happen. Dual becomes obsolete. We don't really need it because why do we need an extra form and we can just pluralize the dual? Let's just make it a plural. Everyone understands what people are talking about anyway, so why not just get rid of that obsolete form that's archaic and confusing to people anyway? We barely ever use it, so let's just make it a plural. That's the process that people used when uh, changing language over time. But so if you have, um, if you have, you know, two hands, like in English, we would say two hands. Oh, wait, that's, that's Hebrew. Okay, hold on. <laughs> English, what am I talking about? Times New Roman. All right, so, so we have hand is singular, hands is plural. This isn't the old English. I'm just making it up here at this point because I don't remember what it is, but it would be, it would be like dual would be, dual would be handis. It's basically, it's a different ending at the end where it did have an ending for dual, but I don't remember the endings for Old English. So I'm just kind of showing you guys 
this concept here. So, so a um, some animals have more than two hands. Therefore, you would use this ending, the s, the, the plural ending. But humans and many animals only have two hands, and therefore you would use the dual. Same thing with feet, except uh, we we plural in English we pluralize it uh, as feet. But let's pretend we didn't, just to make the comparison understandable. Okay. Um, so you got the singular foot, the plural foots, and the dual would be footus. Again, these are made up because I, I know that uh, that's not how it works in English, but uh, I'm trying to com convey how this would work if it was happening the same way in English. Okay. So um, humans have two feet, therefore it would be footus, but some you know animals often have four feet, therefore the animals that have four feet would be four foots, not footus, but foots. Um, but yeah, you would do that for anything with, with a set of two. Two parents, you would have would have parent, parentus. And then parents. So if you're referring to a group of parents that are more than two, you would say parents with the S. But if you're talking about your two parents, for example, parentus. Twins would be twiness. You know, but uh, if there was more than one group of twins, you would say twins with the plural. So anyways, that's the basic idea here. Um, now, I believe that there once existed a neuter gender in Hebrew, but the evidence for that is not very compelling. But when it, what's interesting is that Akkadian preserves an alternate plural, the yod nun, that Aramaic preserves. And so there is some potential evidence of a of a different plural that coincided at the same time, and I think that that could be an archaic remnant of the neuter gender. But for all practical purposes for learning the Hebrew language, you don't really need to know about the neuter concept too much, except in very rare cases, you're going to see um, it occur in the Bible and in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So kings is usually spelled with a mem, malakim, but occasionally in the Bible and the Dead Sea Scrolls, you're going to see a noon instead, malakim. What's interesting is then the noon ending is also occurs in Aramaic. That's the standard Aramaic plural. It also occurs it occurs, I believe it occurs in Arabic. I'd have to double check that to make sure. But it, it also occurs, like I said, in Akkadian. And Akkadian also has the normal form uh, as well. So it has both at the same time, just like Hebrew has both. So there is some good reason to believe that both endings are part of the original language and had different meanings. So they have come due to the evolution of, evolution of the language to mean the same thing, plural, masculine plural. But originally, the noon, the yod noon ending probably meant something different than the yod mem ending. They were similar, but they did have a different meaning. Um, but now, the final thing that I'll share with you guys, and then we're gonna do uh, we're gonna do some uh, practice together, okay? And that is. The, the feminine word for the feminine for words in Hebrew has the hey ending, right? Like I said, but originally that's not the case. Original Hebrew instead had uh, a tav ending instead of a hey ending. 
So whenever you see ha as a feminine ending, just remember that original Hebrew didn't have that, it had a tav. And the evidence to support that is in Akkadian, Arabic, Ethiopian, uh, all kinds of different, uh, Aramaic as well, I believe. They all have tav as the ending for feminine, for singular. But Hebrew has, hey, why did that happen? Why did tav get changed into a hey? The reason it got changed is because of sound pronunciation over time. So it sounded like a hey over time, and the tav became very soft, almost silent, and then eventually did become silent. So for example, the English word, um, the English word could, right? It has an L there. Originally, it was pronounced, it was cold, and should was originally pronounced shall. It's, it's, the, it's the past tense of shall, actually. Should is the past tense of shall. Um, and so it basically had the pronunciation of like shall or should, should. But over time, the L became very soft, almost silent, and then eventually did become silent. Should, 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 should. In the same way, originally it was, it had the sound of a, of a, of a if, a if. So it'd be like malakith, uh, malakith. You, it's it's a very faint ending. It's soft. So you you would say for queen, malakith, malakith. But if you're saying it fast, uh, it's going to sound like there's no th at the end, malakith. And eventually the I became an ah sound, so it'd be malakath, malakath. But you see how the, the th sound at the end becomes soft and almost you can't even hear it sometimes, depending on how you pronounce it. So malakath, malakath. And eventually it becomes malakath. And the th gets dropped, and that's what happened in Hebrew. But the original was th. And this is actually preserved in a few Hebrew words. For example, the word for the word for daughter in Hebrew is bana. No, excuse me. Excuse, what am I talking about? It's 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 uh it's bath. Okay, bath like Bathsheba means daughter of Sheba. But in all the other languages, well, first let me show you the, the plural. The plural of daughter is banot. Where, where did the N come from? Where did the noon come from? I thought the singular was bat or bat. Why did it become banat? And where did the, where did the tav uh, go? Why did it disappear? Well, the reason is because originally the word was not bat, it was banat. And then the plural, the plural of banas is banoth. Uh, and virtually every other language preserves this. I think it might be Aramaic that doesn't, and I can't remember, but uh, every other Semitic language, excuse me. So Arabic, Akkadian, Ethiopian, they all have this noon preserved as part of the original word. Benoth, or benoth, and then the plural is benoth. But the scribes changed it over time. And basically what happened is, so originally it was pronounced as benoth, but then it started being pronounced as a single syllable. So instead it started being pronounced, okay, so, uh, or baneth, But eventually it started being pronounced as 
bins, bins or bags. And then, like I said, the N becomes silent. This happens a lot in Akkadian, actually. The, the, if you have a noon before another consonant, the noon gets dropped out and it's not written. So ba, because you can't hear the N anymore, it becomes silent, just like in could, the English word could and should. So banth becomes ba, and that's what happened there. So there, there are, there is evidence of the loss of the original and the uh, preservation of the tav ending. And there's even more evidence of tav being part of the original, but I don't want to keep going on this because I did say we were going to do uh, some practice. So now let's go to the practice. Sorry, everyone, for taking more time than intended for this portion. Because like I said, I had originally wanted to do about an hour of practice, but we're not going to do quite an hour. So now with that said, we're in the practice portion. For those who mainly were interested in the uh, lesson, you can uh, leave, or if you're watching the recording, you can uh, stop listening here. But I really do recommend that you practice with us because even if you know this information already, it's good to review it. And we're trying to become fluent. And the best way to do that is to, to keep repeating it and look at it over and over again, practice it together with other people, and spending time together doing it, it's going to become more relevant to you. Socialization, and that will help you become fluent in the language. That's our goal. That's our goal that I have, and hopefully you guys have as well, should become fluent in Hebrew. So with that said, let's get started. Uh, I, I did say that I would share my screen first to convey what we're doing. So let me get something here. Um, all right, first, uh, let's pick, we're going to pick the Book of Obadiah. Okay, so pick the Book of Obadiah. And I've got the, I'm going to get the Hebrew here. The Hebrew text. And what we're going to do today is we're going to transliterate using the information we had from, from last week's meeting. We're going to work together on this. I want you guys to practice right now. If you have a document file, you can open it in a Word file. Or I use OpenOffice. That's my, that's my personal choice, but you can use any document type of program. Uh, the reason it's taking me a while to get to this is because I was I'm trying to look on Bible Gateway and I was looking at only English Bibles when I'm trying to look at Hebrew. So where's Hebrew? I'm confused. Where is it? While I'm looking this up, uh, just uh, to open in whatever program you guys have, Obadiah chapter one, and look at the Hebrew text. All right. All right, there we go. Don't know why it was taking me so long to find it on this list. All right. I oh, mean, it has the vowel markings on here. Oh, well. Actually, I don't like the fact that it has the vowel markings, so I'm not going to use that. I'm going to use Blue Letter Bible because it lets you 
In Blue Letter Bible, it lets you toggle the vowel markings off. And it's going to make it easier to, to look at for us. The vowel marking is unnecessarily complicated for people who are newly studying the language. So, so I'm opening a file now. Um, all right. Gonna make the font 20 font. That's my normal thing I like to do. All right, and then I'm gonna have to share the screen. So let me just get that for you guys. Um, all right, so hope you guys can see the screen, good. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to produce my rendering of the letters. So I'm looking at the letters here. Now, what we're doing is the, is the letter correspondence. We're not looking at this, the pronunciation because the pronunciation rendering is going to be different than the letter correspondence. For now, we're sticking, we're sticking strictly to letter correspondence, okay? So the first letter is a het. And last week, we said that was an H. So I'm going to say H. And then a Zion, Z. Then there is a, a, a Wa. There's different ways of rendering it. You can do U or W. I would recommend U. So H, Z, U. And then that one I didn't show you guys, but that one is a, a ending for a noon, a letter noon. So, uh, and, then, and then you have Ion. Bet, Dalit, Yod. Yod can be a I or a Y. I'm just going to go with the vowel forms of, of, the, of these letters. So, all right. So I'm only doing the one verse, and then I'm going to have someone else try the same thing on their file. If, if anyone is willing to, to do this, just for practice. Occasionally I'm doing, you can see I sometimes type something and then I backspace because I'm I realize, whoops, I typed the wrong, I typed the wrong letter. All right. And so that's basically that's uh, essentially what we're doing here is we're going to try to put the letters of the Hebrew alphabet into the English letters. And then this this gives you a good way of guessing how you pronounce it just by look i'm going to look at the english right now and, and say okay hazun obadia k mr adani yua ladom simua simona uh mat Yoa, Ujir, Baguim, Salah, or Salah, 
Kumu, uh, Unnekume, Alia, Lamalhema. Yeah. And of course, I'm just going off the, uh, the way it looks. Uh, I don't have it memorized, the correct pronunciation. But what I just said is, it's obviously it's not the correct pronunciation. But it kind of is, in some ways, it's similar to the correct pronunciation, and, it, and it's not too far off. Um, this gives you a general guide by just, just by changing the letters from Hebrew to English, you're going to see, wow, this basically, this, these are the letters. But then we're going to later on, not today, but in, a, in future videos, not next week or, you know, but eventually we're going to start also trying to pronounce it correctly transliterate it correctly into pronunciation but right now the transliteration is just for the correspondences but yeah so this is what it is uh so does do i do we have any volunteers for oh uh, melissa asked wait okay gregory says uh good class good night everyone and i guess he left already I didn't see that, but uh, uh, you know, maybe he'll watch the recording later. Who knows? But anyways, uh, I thank Gregory for coming on, and um, do all Hebrew words come from a root word? I would say yes. I mean, there are a few words which are one letter, or which may not necessarily come from a root in the same way. Um, oh, by the way, two letter roots actually come from three letter roots, and that is accomplished by the, the second letter being doubled twice. So let's say you have the word Aleph Lamed, which is L. That would come from the root Alil. It'd be two L's. And for any two letter word, the, the second the, the third letter would be the second letter doubled. So the word for father is Aleph Bet. It would be Aleph Bet Bet. It would be doubled. And I can give some evidence for that as well, supporting evidence for that uh, from Akkadian, for example. But I'll do that another time. For now, we want to stick mainly with um, trying to do this practicing. So does anyone want to practice here? I would strongly recommend someone uh, uh, volunteer. That way uh, it becomes more interactive. So I'm gonna stop sharing the screen here. What so, do you want me to try? So do you have a Hebrew font on your computer? Mm. Or you know, you don't need Hebrew font, but uh, do you have, you have a document file? You can access Blue Letter Bible. Yes. So if you go to Blue Letter Bible, Obadiah chapter one, I want you to then go to verse two, copy the Hebrew from verse two, turn off the vowel markings. There's a little checkbox. You click the checkbox to turn off the vowel markings. You copy it, paste it into your document file, and then you're gonna transliterate it into English. Oh, I better let you do that. <laughs> Well, I want one of you guys to do it. Anyone, any volunteer? But the professor, nope. the, the professor could have done it, but he failed. <laughs> well, he knows how to do it probably, but- uh, Yeah, why'd he leave? Uh, he said he was tired. Oh. So, yeah, you know, but uh, let me, um, let me get the program. I mean, let me let me show you guys. It's not too hard. So, okay, Steve says he's on his phone, so he probably can't do it. Um, Adam probably doesn't want to. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Melissa, you should do it, but I'll I'll show you how to do it. Okay, it's pretty easy. Well, if you don't, if you absolutely don't want I'm to. I'm watching. I'm going to, um, can I do this on my laptop? Even though oh, I'm are, on my... are, are you on your phone? Yeah. Right, never, never mind then. No, don't do that. 
Um, what about Edmund? Uh, are you open to doing it? You, you don't have to talk, uh, but uh, let's see. Uh, he can't. Um, so right now, no one on the call. Oh yeah, Jesse, I forgot. Jesse's on the call. Jesse, do you want to? But no one's required. So if you don't want to, I'll do it. I'll just keep doing it myself. In the future, hopefully other people will um, want to volunteer. But so if you go to verse, what the heck's going on here? Um, all right, there we go. So basically you go to the verse, you see this right here? It says, whoops, sorry, uh, hold on. So it says show valid points. So you click, you click it on and off. The valid points just make it a mess, right? Yeah, you can't really do it on the phone. So if, if someone wants to do it, they would have to do it on the computer and they could do it next time. Unless they want to log on to their computer now. But otherwise, I'm following along with you. I'm yeah. on my laptop right now. Okay. So I'm going to Blue Letter Bible right now. So yeah, you go to Blue Letter Bible, you turn off the vowel points, you copy it into your document file. I so do I have to put in a verse first? No, you don't have to because we're just we're just well, I'm not we're just practicing. Says, yeah, I'm not seeing where it says to turn off vowel points. So it says, I don't know. It says show vowel points. Maybe that happens after I search for you have to go to the actual verse. Yeah. Okay. So, so you're top, wanting to look up Obadiah. Oh, okay. Obadiah one verse two. So you go to the search box. Obadiah one, two. Verse two. Brings okay. you. You go to the Hebrew. There's a show vowel points box. It's checked off. You uncheck. I've been using this for like 10 years or so, and I've never seen where it said something about vowel points. <laughs> How did I miss that? Where is this? It's, it's at the top right here. You see it on my screen? Um, I don't see it. Is it. It's showing my screen though, right? I'm seeing your screen, but I don't right, see so, where it says all points. So, all right, maybe I have to zoom in for you guys. Oh, way in that little tiny print. Well, <laughs> it's not, I don't see that on my screen. I see it on yours. Yeah, so maybe it's not on your, it, it could be, it could be different depending on what you're using. I wonder um, why, that's weird. So yeah, so you click this, huh. see the vowel marks are on. I find the vowel markings to be ugly, so I turn them off. I see. <laughs> now I see it. I had to click on the verse. Okay. Yes, that's what mm -hmm. you have to do. You have to actually click mm -hmm. on the verse. Yep. And then you you click off the vowel points, copy and paste. Now you only have to copy and paste it if you're going to be showing your screen in future times. Mm hmm. Um. But yeah, so then you just copy it into your document file. So document file? Yeah, like uh, Microsoft Word or whatever document. You open a document. Oh. Hmm. Do you do you have a program like that? I don't have a clue. I don't think so. Like uh, how how do you do documents? You don't do documents? Uh well, it'll sometimes it'll ask me if I want to save a document, and I say yes. So you probably have something. Um, I recommend people download Open Office. It's a great tool. It's similar to Microsoft Word, but it's simpler to use. I highly recommend it. Now, why am I? Why would I save this? What would be the purpose? No, it's not to save it. It's to. It's to. It's to. Um, it's if you were sharing your screen, because like I said, the goal is that in the future, uh, people who are on the call, 
it, like that it won't just be me because I already know this stuff, although it's good to practice for me, but it's it would be important for you guys to practice. So the best way to encourage this is to have people on the call actually do it as well, like live, and they do it, not just me, but they actually work on some of these exercises for us, like as we watch them do it live. Uh, but this time, we won't do it this time, but hopefully someone will be able to do it next time. But so I'm showing you the process. If you are going to do it live, you copy it into a document file. If you're, if you're not going to do it live, then you just type the English words on wherever you want to type it. You can type it uh, in a document file. You just type the English. You don't have to copy and paste anything. You just type it yourself or like on Facebook in a, in a message to yourself or something. You're just typing. Uh, you're typing the English letters. So with that said, we'll go to verse two. Let me share the screen. All right. So we've got here the second verse. All right, so we basically have here, it's roughly as follows. So, so okay, so that's hey, noon, hey. So that's E-N-E, kof, tet, noon, Q-T-H-N, uh, noon, tav, tav, yod, kof, N-T-T-I-K, bet, uh, Gimil wa yod mem b g u i m b z u i b z u i uh, excuse me bet zion wa yod uh, alif tav he a t e and mem alif dalit m a d so just by looking off that without Trying to think of the correct pronunciation, uh, I'm. I would guess that it would be pronounced something like uh, "na kethan natik baguim bazui ata mad." Like I said, of course, this is a simplistic pronunciation because I'm just going off without knowing the correct pronunciation. By thinking about it, I'm just going off the transliteration of the English letters. But if I if I take the time to think, how do you pronounce this correctly? Then I would give a better pronunciation, more accurate. But instead, I'm just giving you, this is how it seems like you would pronounce it if you would transliterate it this way. And that's just kind of giving you a, a, a general guide to see. Even the correspondence preserves very well the basic gist of the pronunciation. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good representation of the, of the pronunciation just by transliterating it with the correspondences between the English and the Hebrew letters. Because again, like, like I showed last time in last meeting, how each letter corresponds to the English letter of the alphabet versus the Hebrew letters of the alphabet. So that was verse two. And I think what we'll do is go through maybe five verses and we'll end it, end the exercise there. So let me, yeah, so I can do that. I can put the, I'm gonna put the name of the Messiah after I do these verses. Excuse me. All right. So verse three. Um, all 
Whoops, that's not what I want. All right. All right, so we got, what we got here is Zion, Dalit, Wa, Noon, Lamid, Bet, Kaf, He, Shin, Yod, Aleph, Kaf, Shin, Kaf, Noon, Yod, Bet, Het, Gimu, Wa, Yod, uh, Samik, Lamid, Ayan, Mem, Resh, Wa, Mem, Shin, Bet, Tov, Wa, Aleph, Mem, Resh, Bet, Lamid, Bet, Wa, Mem, Yod, Yod, Wa resh dalat noon yod aleph resh zadi. So it'd be roughly pronounced uh, just by looking at the this transliteration. Zadun lebak esiak sakini um, bahegui. Bahagui, uh, excuse me. Okay, and then Xiolo, Marum, Sibatu, Amur, Bilabu, Mi, Yuridami, Aret. Okay. That was verse, was that verse three? Or was it verse four? Let's see here. Yeah, that was verse three. Like I said, we're only gonna do five verses today. Now, this might seem tedious, but like we said, we're, we're trying to learn the language, so it's important sometimes to do the tedious stuff like this, tedious repetition, because it's gonna help us remember this stuff. All right, so now we've got Aleph Mem Tav Gimel Bet Yod He Kaf Nun Shin Resh Wa Aleph Mem Bet Yod Nun Kaf Wa uh, Wa Kaf Bet Yod Mem Shin, Yod, Mem, Kof, Nun, Kaf, Mem, Shin, Mem, Aleph, Wa, Resh, Yod, Dalit, Kaf, Nun, Aleph, Mem, Yod, He, Wa, He. So that would be. Essentially, it would be uh, 
am it be pronounced roughly as just based on the transliteration here. Am tigabi kenasar uam bin kukabim sim kenach misam aridach nam yewa. All right. Finally, verse five. Verse five is a little long, not too bad, but a little lengthy. Kind of similar to verse three in length. All right, so what we got here is Aleph Mem Gimel Nun Bet Yod Mem Bet Aleph Wa Lamed Kaf Aleph Mem Shin Wa Dalet Dalet Yod Lamed Yod Lamed He Aleph Yod Kaf Nun Dalit mem yod tav hey hey lamed wa aleph yod gimel nun bet wa dalit yod mem aleph mem bet sadi resh yod mem bet aleph wa lamed kaf hey lamed wa aleph yod Shin Aleph Yod Resh Wa Ayin Lamid Lamid Wa Ta. All right. I actually find it as I'm doing this, it's, I'm getting a little bit faster. So only slightly, but I, so I think if we do this over time, we're, we're gonna you're gonna the the key. I shouldn't even have to think about it. That's why it's so silly that I'm just thinking about it. Because watch, I'm gonna look at the English. Thing I just typed right now, I'm gonna and I'm gonna pronounce it without even thinking. A M G N B I M B A U L K A M S U D D I L I L E A I K N D M I T E E L U A I G N B U D I M A M B J R I M B A U L K E L U A I S A I R U O L U T. That's fluency. That's being fluent in English. You heard me, I was having, you know, I was going slow. I was doing it at a slower pace. I was doing Aleph, Mem, Gimel, Nun, Bet, Yod, Mem, Bet, Aleph, Wa, etc. But when we're fluent, we should be able to do it the same, roughly the same speed. We should be able to not, without even thinking, we, have, we should be like without even thinking. But because, sorry about that, I accidentally pulled up a, uh, I don't know if you saw that. Uh, I pulled up a window of uh, recommended like news or something. <clears throat> I'm not sure what actually gets seen. So when I watch the video, I'll see if, if that came up or not. But um, anyway, so. Yeah, so that's why we need to practice this because until we can immediately recognize it, just like English, we still have room for improvement and we're likely not gonna be fluent if we can't like think automatically in this language. So that's the key. We wanna become robotic with this, like automatic, it just comes natural to us without even thinking. But so now, how would we pronounce this according to this rough guide here? A transliteration. Am ganabim bau lach am sodi lila aik nidamita elua igenabu 
Dim, Am, Bijarim, Bao, Lach, Elua, Esairu, Olut. So, all right, so here's a question. Um, should we try it, like showing pictures? Uh, pictures? Pictures of something? Maybe eventually, but I think that's a little bit farther along the lines. Basically, that's more with the doing vocabulary. We're, we're, before we move to vocabulary, I think it's important to master uh, the alphabet. And people, like I said, we might know the alphabet, but we need to really know it in a way that like, it's just automatic. So we're gonna practice with that first, where we correspond the, the letters. Then we're gonna correspond the pronunciation. We, we wanna get the pronunciation down. And then we will progress to, to learning the words. But Melissa did say, um, we should learn one vocab word every week. So first word is Aleph, <laughs> which is the first letter of the English alphabet. It's also a word, which means ox. <clears throat> it can also mean chief or leader. It can also mean the number 1,000. Whoops, I sent it to Steve. Aleph uh, is, can mean 1,000, it can mean ox, it can mean chief or leader, it can mean to lead someone. So there's different meanings here to the word, but it's the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And that's in fact where the alphabet word comes from comes from the word Aleph, followed by the word Bet, the first two letters of the alphabet. <clears throat> You've heard people probably say Aleph Bet, because that's how Hebrews pronounce it. The Greeks pronounce it as Alpha, the letter pronounced as Alpha, and the second letter is Beta. So Alpha Bet, or Greek, it would be Alpha Beta. So now, let me see, all right, so 1032. So we got about, you know, maybe 10 more minutes here. I wanna see if you guys can hear my computer. Is there a way to share my sound? Yes, today's show is brought to you by the letter L, exactly. <clears throat> computer audio, there we go. I can say computer audio. Or share computer audio. All right. So sharing computer sound. We're going to hear, can I share screen at the same time as the audio? No, I don't think so. That's weird. There should you should be able to do that. I have to, I have to look. I gotta look that up because there should be a way you can share both the audio and a screen. Um, yeah, so I shared the audio, but then when I tried to share, when I tried to share the screen and the, the computer audio thing went away. So here's what I'm going to do for you guys. I'm going to type in the box. The chat box all the all the english that we did and i'm going to have you listen to how it's pronounced 
by Jews or Christians. Basically, how how the uh, the traditional pronunciation of Hebrew is, and we're going to see how close how close whether or not my uh, transliteration is a close approximation to pronunciation. Let's see what we what we find on that. I think we're going to see that. In general, it's going to be not too far away. It's going to be a good indicator of the correct pronunciation. So let's see here. So I'm saying it in chat box now, separated by lines. All right. So sharing computer audio sound. Let us begin with the first verse that we will hear sound. Oh, uh, man. All right, I have to go to a different website to do this. Um, shoot, I thought I had it. Um, Hebrew audio Bible, there we go. I'll just look that up. That'll, we'll probably get that. This is MP3 recordings of the Hebrew Bible, Meccan Mamre, or Mamre.org. So let's see what we got here. Obadiah, where are you? I picked Obadiah because it's, it's very simple, okay? Because it's one chapter. So let's begin. Follow, follow, along, follow along in the... Uh, in the chat box uh, where I showed you guys the uh, where I copied and pasted the transliteration and see if, if the listen to the pronunciation and see if it's see if it's similar okay all right just about to begin oh but yeah Hazon Ovadia Go Amar Adonai Elohim Le Edom Shemua Shamanu Me et Adonai Vetsir Bagoim Shullah Kumu Venakuma Aleha Lam Milhama Yinekaton Netatiha Bagoim Bazui Atta Meod Zedon Libeha Hishi Echa Shokini Vehag Vesela Merom Shipto Omer Belibo, mi yorideni arets. Im tag biyah kam nesher, ve im ben kochavim sim kinneha, mi sham oridecha neum adonai. Im gam navim baulecha, im shodede laila, ech nidmeta. Halo yignevu dayam, im botselim baulach, halo yashiru olelot. So what what did you guys think? Did it sound did it seem like to correspond pretty good? Not exactly. Of course, they replaced Yahweh with Adonai, for example. Uh, that was one difference. And then there's a few different things, like for example, uh, instead of wa or u sound, they gave it a v sound, va, instead of a wa or a u. So, um, but it's going to be closer when we actually do the pronunciation together. But for now, we're just doing the correspondences. Um, and then I, mean, uh, I was asked to show the, the name of the Messiah. So let me do that now. And then we'll pretty much end it here. But I would like some feedback from you guys. So just give me some feedback once, uh, once I share. And then
Um, okay. All right, so we've got here, Messiah's name. This is what I believe his name is. So that would be transliterated as I, E, U, S, O, or I E U S H O Yusha. Um, no, so Blue Letter Bible doesn't play the audio. Oh, yeah, it does play the audio of each word. Yes, correct. But it doesn't. So the audio of each word is like sort of like kind of like the root, if you will, or not really the root, but like. The main word itself it doesn't show um all the different uh like endings pronunciation correctly so don't rely too much on the audio on blue letter bible because that's only giving you the core it's not giving you all the different ways of pronouncing it with the different endings and and prefixes and stuff like that um i'm not sure steve if you were in intentionally put on your video or not just wanted to let you know you have your video on just in case that wasn't intentional all right just wanted to make sure because you know some people don't want some people are funny about their face being on camera or anything like that so but certainly people can have their video there's no issues with that yeah so um so that's the hebrew uh, the Paleo Hebrew doesn't matter too much, but let's show the Paleo. I say it doesn't matter too much just because the Messiah's name was probably primarily written in the biblical Hebrew that we're familiar with. But of course, Joshua, which is what the name is for, was written in Paleo Hebrew. So that would be what it looks like in Paleo Hebrew, roughly. You can see the IN looks just like an O, English O, just in, on the opposite side. Yod looks like an I. Hey looks like an E. So watch. Let me uh, let me show you guys. Oops. See, look how similar this is. It's just reversed. The only really main difference is the letter S. And even then, it's kind of similar. Now, all right, so in the Greek, we have it as Jesus. That's really more like Jesus. Um, yes, Jesus. So in reality, it has an ending. The us ending is a case ending. So really, the Greek form 
is useful. Or, whoops, sorry. Or, yeah, sure. Yeah, so like yes, yes, so yes, so. But uh, the O actually has like a ah sound or a sound, a sound. So, so it would be like yusa or yusha. So hopefully that uh, explains the basic pronunciation of what the Messiah's name would be in original pronunciation, but we don't know whether he went by an original pronunciation. Maybe he went by the common pronunciation in his time. So it might've been a little different. However, it does seem it was spelled like this. Some people pronounce it as Yeshua, but Yeshua would be spelled like this or like this. Now, Arabic has Isa. Isa would be more like this. Um, but really the best evidence of his name in the Bible, Joshua, is Yusa. Yeah, he also spoke Aramaic, so maybe his name was written in it, pronounced in an Aramaic word. Um, I'm not sure how it was spelled in Aramaic, actually. All right, guys, so pretty much we are at the end of our second meeting. Did you guys like it? Want, have any final thoughts you wanted to share? Anything I said which was a little confusing to you? You want some clarification on? Do you have any questions for future meetings that we can talk about? Feel free to share now. I'll give you just a small amount of time to type what you want to say. What do you think about flashcards? I know it sounds silly, but do you think it's a good idea to use flashcards? I don't think it's a bad. I don't think it's a bad idea. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Like, you know, I wouldn't advise someone, yeah, that's a good idea. But if someone wanted to do that, I don't see any harm in that. And I, I do think there could be some good benefit for in that for that person. Um, it depends people's learning styles, you know. But yeah, blue letter bible. Yeah, Edmund said he thinks he'll definitely use blue letter bible more. Yeah, definitely. It's some really good re resource and i've learned a lot from blue letter bible oh yeah i've been on there for i mean i was on there for a couple of years and then i just i don't know i got on a computer that was really slow and i had a bad connection so it seemed like it but today i got right on there it was going fast so and you can print stuff off is the good thing right off your computer you know yeah. you can just hit print and now, Steve said that he's got some, like some questions or, or what? Oh, flashcards, okay. Um, yeah, so, uh, no, um, and it's not clear to me all right, never mind. I was gonna say I wasn't sure if Steve uh, was always sending a message to me, but I see he sometimes sends it to everybody, so that's good. But uh, yeah, so the vowel markings we're probably not gonna touch on them mostly, at, almost at all. Vowel points. We may touch upon them a little bit in our future, but it's not going to be a, a in, an in-depth study of it because we don't really need to know it. Okay, so it looks like everybody's good here. I think everybody had a, I think that people enjoyed this. I hope you guys enjoyed it anyway. And stay tuned for next week. 
Yeah, I don't like the vowel markings, the vowel points. They are overcomplicated. So stay tuned for lesson number three, where I will try to share some more cool information about Hebrew. And then we will try to practice some more. God bless you guys. And hope you have a great rest of the week. Good Shabbat. And I'll see you next, next, next Thursday. Shalom. Shalom. Peace, everybody.